Thank you so much, Pastor Murray, and greetings, brethren, here, as well as our brethren joining us online. You'll have to give me a couple of minutes or seconds to get oriented to this again. It's been a while since I've spoken, and it's been a while since we've been together. It's nice to see everybody again. We were in uh, South Africa with Feast. So I had a business meeting in Vienna, so we spent some time in Vienna. Then we went to Amsterdam, we went to Cape Town, and we had the Feast in Mossel Bay. And then on the way back, we had some time again in Cape Town and Amsterdam. So it was a great break in terms of some vacation. Uh, it was great in terms of work. And it was great with the fellowship, with the brethren for the feast. So when we were in Mossel Bay, uh, first time in that part of the world. And what I can tell you is the Holy Spirit is alive and well. And uh, when we meet brethren with, that share the Holy Spirit, you just click right away. So we had a wonderful time there. I was impressed with the business sophistication in South Africa. Somehow I didn't expect it to be as advanced as it is. In some ways, I think it's further advanced uh, than we are. I was really impressed, just society in general, with the politeness of the South Africans. Very polite, very friendly. I was also impressed with the racial harmony. I, I remember in university hearing a lot about apartheid and about the ANC party. In fact, they came to my university and spoke. And to see that it's just gone. Uh, blacks and whites just mix freely. They're happy. They hug each other, both in the church and in society at large. I, I did ask several people, uh, the common man on the street, inside the church. Whenever I asked them about Nelson Mandela, everybody had like real high regard for this man. Incredible respect for him. And when they would ask them about the ANC, nobody had any respect. The ANC has betrayed the people of South Africa. And that's, a, that's so, so unfortunate. We did uh, extremely well, I would just say financially. The exchange rate is ridiculous. Uh, we have five course meal with wine and pay the bill and I do the conversion. I'm like, that was $90. We would pay three times that much here in Canada for an equivalent meal. So we ate very, very well, uh, but especially well when we imposed ourselves on a, on a couple. We said, we would like to eat an authentic South African meal. Can you have us over and, and, and cook a meal for us? So they were happy to do that. We had a lovely meal, uh, very authentic. I even ate with my hands to get the full experience. My wife ate with knife and fork. She, she wanted the experience, but not full. And uh, it was wonderful. So we told somebody the next day we had a wonderful a South African meal. Oh, who'd you have it with? So he said who he had it with. And they said, well, they're from Zimbabwe. So you didn't actually have a South African meal. So we were invited over another day. We had another lovely meal. They were also from Zimbabwe. So I think we might have to go back to actually have a South African meal. The last time that I was here, and I forgot about the reconfiguration. I, I really enjoy this. The last time that I was here, I spoke to you about the scroll of Zechariah and holiness to the Lord, and how the feast sites, or the feast days, really show us what holiness to the Lord means, and that there are three levels of holiness. And I cautioned against replacement theology. And in fact, when I was at the feast, I had an opportunity to sit with an elder and, and inquire about their understanding of replacement theology. And so we had a good discussion. What I want to do today is encourage us all to not rest on our laurels in terms of our understanding of God's word. Let me, let me put it this way. Are we all learning? Do we know everything? Or, or do we continue to learn? I think we'd all agree we continue to learn. So if I learn something today that I didn't know yesterday, would you agree that I had an element of ignorance yesterday? So if I have some level of ignorance, if I have to continue learning, I have to acknowledge that I'm ignorant. I don't know everything. I don't have all the answers. So how can it be, or, or is it appropriate for me as a, as a teacher to never learn? To basically say, I have the word of God buttoned down, and I'll just keep recycling what I've always said, because I know everything? Or is it that even as a teacher, I have to be a student and I have to dig into God's word 
and come to a deeper appreciation for God's word. Pastor Murray, I did ask you, Pastor Murray, for your sermon. What was the name of the sermon? I didn't get to check. Are we growing in knowledge? Perfect. So this is something that we're encouraged to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Pastor Murray actually gave a sermon, Are We Growing in Knowledge, where he really went into detail on this onus on us to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord. And if we're doing that, it means we're growing out of a state of ignorance, which also means that we don't know everything today. And I think we have to have that humility. When we were on our way home from Cape Town at the Cape Town airport, we got there a bit early. So we were sitting, we were having a coffee, a tea, and a, a nice young lady, she must have been 19 or 20 years old. Uh, she was from Brazil, uh, spoke very broken English, but she came to us and said, can I pray for you? And I said, well, who are you praying to? And she said, Jesus Christ. I said, well, who is Jesus Christ? And so she explained to me that he's the savior and tried her best to explain in her English. And I said, what is your understanding of his covenant with Israel? And so she tried to explain her understanding and it was, she understood that we were grafted in. So she got that much out. I asked her, can I, can we study? As I opened the, I took out my computer and we studied together and she was humble. And, and I think she was trying to understand where her understanding was perhaps a bit off. And so I said, can I pray for you? And so we prayed for her. And her name is Isadora, lovely young lady, big heart for the Lord, superficial understanding. And I think the word of God is very deep. Let's go to Proverbs 25. Proverbs 25, let's open there. Where... Let's agree that the word of God reflects the mind of God. And the mind of God is not superficial. The mind of God is very deep. So we can never be in a position where we just think we skim off a superficial layer like uh, Isadora, and that's it to the mind of God. We have to go deep. And as we go deep, we realize more and more just how much we don't actually know. Proverbs 25, and look at verse 2. It is the glory of God. This is his glory to conceal a thing. Well, how about that? It's the glory of our creator to actually conceal. You'll get a lot of uh, Muslims saying, well, where did Jesus Christ say that he is the son of God or that he is God? Well, it's the glory of God to conceal a thing. But the honor of kings is to search out a matter. As kings, this is our honor, to search out what has been concealed, what is not available to the public. Isadora, with the biggest heart as she has, this thing is concealed. We have to search it out. Let's go to Deuteronomy 31 to see what is it that's being concealed. Why, why is there so much confusion about the gospel? Why is there so much confusion about Jesus Christ? In Mossel Bay, we had a beautiful uh, balcony uh, unit looking overlooking the, the ocean. And in the mornings, you'd see the uh, surfers come. And a whole, there was a school teaching the kids how to surf. And it's an amazing thing. You see the waves coming in, bigger, and they're waiting for a big wave. And when it comes in, they're surfing. And so I'm having my tea, and I'm watching these surfers. And it occurs to me, there's a big difference between surfing and scuba diving. They're, they're two completely different things. And so when you see the surfers, when they fall into the water and go below the surface, that's failure. For a scuba diver to stay on the surface, that's failure. They're <laughs> two different things. And I think scripturally, it's okay to surf as, as youth in the church, if we're, we're young in the faith, it's okay to surf on, go along the surface and sort of get the lay of the land. But once we become mature in Christ, we're scuba divers. We have to go deep. 
Deuteronomy 31, verse 17. God says, this is in the Torah, Then my anger shall be kindled against Israel in that day, and I will forsake them. Listen, and I will hide my face from them. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing. It's in, it, in his design, in his plan, in the gospel, is this narrative from the Torah that God says, I'm going to hide my face. from you. And this is going to create confusion. This is going to create a false gospel. This is going to create false theology because nobody understands what God is doing. He has hidden his face from them and they shall be devoured and many evils and troubles shall befall them. So that they will say in that day, are not these evils come upon us? Because our God is not among us. And listen, I will surely hide my face in that day for all the evils which they shall have wrought. In that they are turned unto other gods. This is Torah. This is foundational knowledge. This is scuba diving. Where we start at the foundation. And now as we navigate the scriptures, we never forget what's in the foundation. It's one narrative. The gospel, the true gospel, is a story. The true gospel is a narrative that begins in the Torah and ends in the apocalypse, in, in Revelation. So anytime we're talking about the gospel, it has to fit from the foundation. The Hebrew Bible the Jews would refer to it as the Tanakh, the Tanakh, because it has three parts. It's the Torah, the Ta, the Nevi'im, the prophets, you know, and the Ketuvim, the writings. So the Tanakh has these three parts. And then we have the Berit Hadashah, which we call the New Covenant or the New Testament. And it has three parts. We have the Gospel Acts, we have the letters, and we have the Apocalypse. If we're scuba divers, well, if we're, if we're surfers, we can pick out scriptures here and pick out scriptures there and try to make meaning out of these scriptures, and in no way, shape, or form are they connected. We just make stuff up, and it sounds good. If we are scuba divers, everything connects. Any explanation that we are giving of any scripture, we can find support for that explanation in the Torah, in the Nevi'im, in the Ketuvim, as well in the Berit Harasha. It's just, it's one story, and it's all the gospel message. So I have three points. As I try to encourage us to rightly divide the word of truth. The first point is, the true gospel is hidden. It's hidden. It's not available to the general public. It's not available to the, to, to the rebellious Jew. It is only available to the first fruits. And even we have to dig it out. It's, just, it's not on the surface. We have to scuba dive and connect all the parts and say, yes, this is the true gospel. Number two, the true gospel cannot be separated from Judah. If we're preaching a gospel that excludes Judah, it's a false gospel because the true gospel is a narrative that, that, is, that, that is centered on Judah and on Christ's covenant relationship with Judah. If we're preaching a gospel that excludes Judah, we might as well say our God is a liar. We might as say that, that our God makes promises that he, he has no intention of keeping. The true gospel cannot be separated from Judah. And number three, because the gospel is hidden, and it cannot be separated from Judah. And the, the, the understanding is not on the surface. Let not many be teachers. This, this is a very, very serious vocation. What we teach, or those of us who have the privilege to teach, we are affecting the minds of God's people. We are affecting the perspective and the outlook, and therefore the behavior of God's people. It's a dangerous thing. God, God takes doctrine, teaching seriously. Let not many be teachers. Let's explore point one. 
the gospel is hidden. And I don't know if you've ever had something of great value that you've hidden. So to me, I had something of great value in a box with a key. And so I hid the key. And I was very careful to hide it in a really special place. Like, nobody's going to find this, including me. <laughs> I, I couldn't find the key. And so I was beside myself, where did I put this key? I finally, like months later, I needed something else that was hidden. And when I went to the place where that was hidden, the key was hidden inside that. So when something is hidden, it means it's not available. It's not on the surface. If it's the glory of God to conceal a matter, it means it's not on the surface. Let's go to 2 Timothy 2, where Daniel was. 2 Timothy 2. And let's just pick up a bit more context for this passage in verse 8. 2 Timothy 2, beginning in verse 8. Listen. Remember that Jesus Christ, Jesus Christus, Yeshua HaMashiach, of the seed of David, was raised from the dead. Remember this. Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel. Well, if it's according to his gospel, why is it so significant that he mentions not just Jesus Christ, but that he's of the seed of David? How is the seed of David connected to this gospel? We, we don't want to be on the surface. We need to go deep. We need to understand this from Torah, from Tanakh to Revelation. That the gospel is somehow connected to the fact that Christ is of the seed of David. Wherein Paul says, I suffer trouble. This, this depth of understanding that I have, that Yeshua is of the seed of David and was raised from the dead according to the gospel. I'm suffering trouble for that as an evildoer. I, I, I'm just teaching you the gospel. And they're treating me like an evildoer. I'm just telling you the gospel is tied to the fact that Christ is of the seed of David, even unto bonds that put me in jail. But do what you want. The word of God is not bound. Although it's concealed, it's not bound. And it, 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 the truth will be revealed. So there's going to be conflicting teaching, conflicting theologies. The truth of God is not bound. And eventually it's going to cover the entire planet. He says, because of his understanding that even though they can bind him, they cannot bind the, the word of God. He says, therefore, I endure all things. Why, why is he so committed for the elect's sake? Oh, there's an elect. This is not about everybody. The gospel is not about everybody. It, it's focused on the elect. There's a story around the elect that begins in the Torah. I endure everything for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation. So the gospel is about a salvation, which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory for the elect. How do we make sense of this? Do, do we have an understanding of the gospel that when we're confronted with a passage like this, we can make sense of it right away? He says, listen, it's a faithful saying. It's a faithful saying. He, he is so convicted of this gospel message that even if he is put to death, he says, if we be dead with him, it's okay. Because the word of God is true. The gospel is true. If we are dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. But if we deny him, he'll deny us. So this, this gospel message, again, Pastor Murray gave a message, an offensive gospel. This is an offensive gospel. This truth is not palatable. But we cannot deny him. If, we're, if we think we can get through this life trying to be palatable, well, let's not teach this because society doesn't like it. Let's not teach this because somebody, let not many be teachers. Not everybody has the backbone for this. Step down. It's okay. If you don't have the backbone for this, what does Paul say? I suffer trouble as an evildoer. Look what they've done to my reputation. Even unto bonds. But the word of God is not bound. The teacher has the privilege of bringing the word of God, whatever the expense. The expense is the expense. 
the truth is the truth. Because if we deny him, he'll deny us. If we don't believe, yet he abides faithful. It's impossible for God to be unfaithful. This is the gospel message. That we can go into the Torah, we can establish the promises in the Torah, and despite the fact that the covenant people are unfaithful, it's impossible for God to be unfaithful. This is the gospel. He cannot deny himself. He cannot deny his promises. He cannot deny that he's the Holy One of Israel. Are we preaching a gospel that we are saying that he's denying himself? That he's changed his mind? That he's not an, a, a covenant keeper? And then he says, once we understand all of this, he says to Timothy, of these things, put them in remembrance. Make sure they don't forget these things. Charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. There, there are conversations we can have that are not edifying. Pastor Murray in his prayer mentioned the consequential election next week. And he said, let's not get caught up in this. On the high holy day, I had a brother show up holding a booklet, not the Bible, a booklet that was entitled the Christian case against Donald Trump on the high holy day? And that's what you want to talk about? I had to say, it seems like you're obsessed with the man. But I queried a little bit and then drop it. This is the high holy day. Uh, a conversation or, or a polarization around politicians in the church of God is to the subverting of the hearers. So we have to have this discernment to say, is this conversation profitable? Is it edifying? And if it's not, he says, don't strive about words to no profit that are actually going to subvert the hearers. Instead, instead, do this. Study. Labor. Put some effort into this. Why? Because it's the glory of God to conceal a matter. But it's the glory of kings to search it out. So this is, not, this is not sitting on the surface. If it was sitting on the surface, we wouldn't have to labor to show ourselves approved. But this is the imperative. We, the students, have to labor to, you say, to show yourself approved, I say it another way, to present ourselves before God. When Christ returns, can we present ourselves to him ready to work? Lord, I understand your mission. I've studied the text. I know now what you're going to do next, and I'm ready to work with you. Or when he shows up, we have no clue what the gospel is. We have no clue. He says, he, he, he comes with his, his reward, his with him, Isaiah 62, and his work is before him. Because we weren't studying, we have no idea what, what is this work that's before him. We should be studying ready, he says, a workman. We're ready, Lord. There's work before you. We've studied. We understand. We're, we're a workman that needs not be ashamed. Means there are going to be workmen that are going to be very ashamed. They have no clue. They were surfing instead of scuba diving with the scriptures. So in order to not be ashamed, he says this. We need to be rightly dividing the word of truth. So to study the word of truth and not be ashamed, the, the, the meaning of rightly dividing is to make a straight cut. When you're studying the scriptures, can we make a straight cut? Can we go from the Tanakh to Revelation and make a straight cut? Any scripture that's presented to us, can we go to any prophet and show support for our understanding? Or does our understanding only exist if we just stay in a certain place and don't go to any other scriptures because we're on the surface? We need to be rightly dividing the word of truth. It's not enough to have the word of truth. It's not even enough to teach the word of truth because we have to be growing in the grace and knowledge of the word of truth so that we can rightly divide it. 
I'll say, to, say this another way. If we are scuba diving, we start with a deep and a profound understanding of the Torah. From the Torah, we can go into the Nevi'im, the prophets. And we understand that all of the prophets are saying the same thing because it's, it's outlined in the Torah. And then we can go into the writings and again, just see everything through the lens of Torah. Then we go into the Berit Hadashah, the new covenant, and it's all the same thing because we've gone down deep. So everything connects. He says instead of rightly dividing the word of truth, because there are surfers, they're not going deep. They're going to try to drag us into profane and vain babblings, which we must shun. Shun it. Don't get involved. Why? They will increase unto more ungodliness. These vain babblings are ungodly. But the power of doctrine, the power of ideas, is they replicate, they multiply. They give birth to other ideas and actions. So we never want to be in a place where we're teaching ungodly things, such as God is done with Judah, that God is a promise breaker, that God is a covenant breaker. This is ungodliness. And if people get this in their mind, they end up with a theology that leads to more ungodliness. Shun these vain babblings. And he says here, and their word, their teaching, their doctrine, will eat as does a canker or gangrene. You, you think of a disease like gangrene, once it gets into the body, it just starts to spread to the point where the only thing you can do is cut off that limb if you're to save the life. That's, this is how serious Paul sees false teaching. This is how serious Paul perceives false doctrine. True teaching, he's ready to die for. False teaching he calls out as gangrene. If this gets into the body, it's going to multiply. And then he calls out two people, of whom, with this sort of false teaching, is Hymenaeus and Philetus. Calls them by name. They're coming into the body with false teaching. What is their false teaching? He tells us. Who concerning the truth have erred. So, study to show yourself approved so that you're ready to work, rightly dividing the word of truth. So the burden is not so much on the teacher. There is a burden on the teacher, but the real burden is on the hearer. The real burden is on us as students. People can say whatever they want, and they will. Philetus will say whatever he wants. Hymenius will say whatever he wants. Is the body able to search the scriptures to see if these things are in fact so? If Paul gets up and gives a sermon one Sabbath, and Philetus gets up and gives a sermon the following Sabbath, and they're clearly contradicting each other, what's our response? I'm going to throw up my hand. I don't know. One says this, the other says that. I don't know. Oh, well, is that a workman rightly dividing the word of truth? Or do I say, wait a minute, yeah, both were good speakers, or maybe both were pathetic speakers, I don't know, but whatever the, con whatever the speaking delivery is, that's one thing, the other is the content. The content is contradictory. I'm hearing one thing from one teacher, I'm hearing another thing from another teacher, I've got to be a workman now. <laughs> now the work begins. What does the Word of God actually say? I've got to do some scuba diving here because Paul is saying the consequences of false teaching is catastrophic. The, in one way, the consequences of true teaching is catastrophic, but in a, in, a, in a positive light, in the sense that he says, if we die with him, we will live with him. If we suffer with him, we will reign with him. So yeah, there are consequences to truthful teaching, but the consequences of false teaching, he says, is gangrene. 
It's like an ulcer in the body. So you and me as students, we have to show ourselves approved, rightly dividing the word of truth. He says they've concerning the truth, they've erred. They're off. And what was their mistake? Saying that the resurrection is past already. And we know in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul deals with this, where people are teaching that the resurrection is already past, or, or, or there is no resurrection. These are false teachings. So they're telling the brethren, you know, the resurrection is already past. And in doing that, they overthrow the faith of some. So this is a, a specific mistake that Hymenius and Philetus were making. It doesn't mean that unless you make this particular mistake, this scripture doesn't apply. I could be making a mistake here where I'm teaching you, God is done with Judah. The church has replaced Judah. That is my mistake. And so I am overthrowing the faith of some. In fact, if I take this message to Judah, that God is done with you, he's replaced you with the church, I'm overthrowing the faith of Judah. There are Jews that could hear the true gospel as they are prophesied to do and are prophesied to repent, but I'm overthrowing their faith by teaching a false gospel. Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands sure. The foundation of God is in the Torah. That's where we gain our understanding, and it stands sure. It can never be uprooted. It doesn't matter how much false teaching comes against it. It stands sure. He says, I might be bound, but the word of God is not bound. The foundation stands sure. So if we, if we do the scuba diving all the way down to the foundation, we're on solid ground. Having this seal, God's put his seal on it. The Lord knows them that are his. Are we his? Are we studying to show ourselves a proof that when he appears, we can present ourselves to him? Lord, I'm ready. I'm ready to be by your side, and you've got your reward, but your work is before you. I'm ready to work alongside you. The Lord knows them that are his. And let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Iniquity is not just behavior. So yes, there's a behavioral level of iniquity. Iniquity is teaching, false doctrine, doctrine that goes against God's word. This is iniquity. So let's study, let's rightly divide the word of truth so that we can depart from iniquity. And declaring God as a liar is iniquity. This is the greatest iniquity, to say that the faithful covenant keeper is in fact a covenant breaker. Depart from iniquity. But, he says, in, in fact, when he says, let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity, the implication is, well, he even says with Philetus and, and Hymenius, that there are going to be those that name the name of Christ, but cuddle up to iniquity. So there's a, there's a whole bunch of people that name the name of Christ, but not all have departed from iniquity. We have to be students that are rightly dividing the word of truth, cutting a straight line so that we can depart from iniquity. But in the great house, he says, there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth. This body of Christ all around the world has vessels of gold and of silver. It also has vessels of wood and of earth. If you go into a house, not everything is made of gold. Not everything is made of silver. There are some things made of wood, some things made of earth, some to honor and some to dishonor. When I was a child, I still have memories of this in England. The house was always cold. And they had coal fires that you turn off at night and you put them back on in the morning, but the house was cold. In the night, every bedroom, pardon me for a little bit of maybe not so pleasant language, every bedroom had a potty that you slipped under the bed. So you wake up in the middle of the night, it's too cold to find your way to the bathroom. So you pull out the potty and you pee in the potty and push it back under the bed. And in the morning when you get up, you carry the potty and discard of it. The potty 
is a vessel in a great house. But it's a vessel of dishonor. In the very same house, you could have a gold cup. That's a vessel of honor. So in a great house, we have vessels of honor and we have vessels of dishonor. You might ask me, well, let's read the, the next verse. If a man therefore purge himself from these, in other words, if as students we are rightly dividing the word of truth, we are putting in the effort, we are doing the scuba diving so that we can purge ourselves from false teaching, he shall be a vessel unto honor. Sanctified, so it's not automatic that because you're in the, in the great house, it's not automatic that we're a vessel unto honor. We have to work at it. We have to study. We have to rightly divide the word of truth and purge ourselves from iniquity and false teaching in order to be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet appropriate for the master's use. There is work to be done. The master has a plan. The master is coming. His reward is with him and his work is before him. And he's looking for first fruits that are ready for his use and prepared unto every good work. So there is good work to be done, and we have to scuba dive to understand what that is and how it's tied to the gospel. But he says, in a great house, you've got honor and dishonor in the vessels. So it means that in the body of Christ, not every vessel in the body of Christ is a vessel unto honor. In the body of Christ, we can have vessels unto dishonor. Where? Do you have proof of that? Let's go to 1 Corinthians 11. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 11. First Corinthians 11. This is a passage that in the past few years, we've spent a lot of time in this passage, so it's going to be very familiar to us. That there are vessels of dishonor in the body of Christ. Verse 18. First of all, when you come together in the church, I hear, I'm, I'm hearing, it's second hand, mind you, but I'm hearing that there are divisions among you. And you know what? I'm inclined to believe it. Why would Paul be inclined to receive such an evil report of the congregation? He says so in the next verse. There has to be, here it says heresies, a better translation would be heretics. Vessels of dishonor. There has to be vessels of dishonor among you. Why? So that the vessels of honor might be approved and identified. So God ensures that the wheat and the tares grow together so that the wheat becomes obvious. And even among the wheat, who is really putting in the effort? And is ready when Christ returns to do the work. So there have to be heretics among, there have to be heretics in the body. Meaning, there have to be factions teaching a false gospel. This is necessary. And we have to put in the work to say, what is the true gospel? Let's go to 2 Corinthians 3. The point that we're making here is that the true gospel is concealed. The true gospel is hidden. And it's the glory, it's to God's glory that this gospel is hidden and will only be revealed at the appropriate time. And he will be glorified as a result. But for the first fruits, future kings, it's our glory to search it out, to put in the work, to understand it. 2 Corinthians 3. And verse 12, seeing then that we have such hope, we, we've heard the true gospel, we have this hope. So seeing then that we have this hope, we use great plainness of speech. We're, we're just very straightforward in our speech. We don't mollycoddle, we don't pussyfoot, we don't speak in circuitous ways, we speak plainly. Because we have this hope. And, and while we might be bound, the word of God cannot be bound. If we are put to death, we will live with him. So because we have this hope, we, we use great plainness of speech. And we're not going to be afraid and 
uh, there's what is it mis dis and malinformation so i just have to constantly tiptoe around because i might step on a misinformation malinformation disinformation landmine that's not the game we're playing we're not playing games we're we're preaching christ with great plainness of speech and not as moses let's go back to torah not as moses which put a veil over his face he covered up that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. Moses went up and spoke face to face with God. And then he veiled himself. He, his glory from speaking to God was not available to Israel. It was hidden from them. The complete Jewish, Jewish Bible translates it this way. Unlike Moshe, who put a veil over his face so that the people of Israel would not see the fading brightness come to an end. I, I think King James is actually better, but I like this notion, because King James says, to the end of that which is abolished, this fading brightness. The understanding that Moses had, which Israel could not access, is actually fading away. It's, it's the old covenant that could not be fulfilled. And so Israel could not even access that. It, 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 it's going to be abolished. It's going to be broken. It's going to be discarded. And it's going to be replaced. But Israel couldn't even access that with this veil that blocked them. But their minds were blinded. It's the glory of God to conceal a matter. Even from Israel. Their minds were blinded. For until this day remains the same veil untaken away. It's, it's untaken away in the reading of the, 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 the Tanakh, the Old Testament. So their minds are blinded. And at the time of Paul writing, he says, even to this day, there's, there's a veil. This thing is hid, this truth is hidden from them in the reading of the Tanakh, in the, he, the Hebrew Bible, which veil is done away in Christ. So what I want to draw our attention to here is the truth is in the Torah in the Nevi'im and in the Ketuvim, the Tanakh. And in Paul's day, it was being read. And Paul's observation is that while it's being read, their minds are blinded. So it says a couple of things. It says, first of all, Paul was aware of the reading. Secondly, he had an understanding of the Tanakh that enabled him to see their minds are blinded. Whatever they were teaching, whatever they were understanding, he understood that their minds were blinded. And that this veil that is blocking them from understanding is only lifted in Christ. But he's in Christ, and so he can see. See what? See the Tanakh. So his understanding, everything he's teaching, is based on his understanding of the Tanakh. This is deep sea diving. He's not saying, oh, Christ has come, and now we don't need to read the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible anymore. It's like, no, because Christ has lifted the veil, we can read the Hebrew Bible and actually understand it. But they can't, because there's a veil. And it's only in Christ that the veil is taken away. But even unto this day, again, his time there, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. So Moses is being read, the Torah is being read, but they cannot understand it because you can only understand it when the veil is taken away in Christ. Nevertheless, it says when it, when he, when, when, when a repentant Israelite shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. And then they will be able to understand the Torah. So when, when, they, when the veil is taken away and they're now open to Christ's understanding and light, are we going to be like Isadora and say to them, can I pray for you? And they say, well, who are you praying to? And we say, Jesus Christ. And they say, well, who's Jesus Christ? Oh, he's the savior of all mankind. Oh, yeah, he's forgotten about you Jews. You don't mean anything. He's just for all mankind now. And they're like, that's not what the Torah says. That's not what the prophets say. That's not what the writings say. What's your level of understanding? And it turns out that we cannot speak to them because now that the veil has lifted,
they understand the Hebrew scriptures at a far deeper level than we do. It has to be that because of rightly dividing the word of truth, when the veil is lifted from people who have memorized the Hebrew Bible, that we can actually teach them, yeah, you've memorized it, but let's go deeper. Let us tell you in Christ what this actually means. Luke 24. The veil is only taken away in Christ. The Torah is not taken away. The foundation that is sure is not taken away. It's there. The veil is taken away. So now we have access to the understanding. And now we can go anywhere. We can go into the Torah. We can go into the prophets. We can go to the writings. We can go to the gospel and acts. We can go to the letters. We can go to Revelation. But because we're deep sea diving, we can connect it all. Luke 24, verse 25. He said unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Everything they've spoken. Are we preaching a gospel where if somebody brings out a teaching of the prophets, we're stuck? It's like, uh, I've never seen this before. I'll have to get back to you. Uh, it does seem to be contradicting what I'm saying. Or it doesn't matter which prophet you want to talk about. We'll show you Christ in that prophet. O oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Verse 27. And beginning at Moses, beginning in the Torah, and the Nevi'im. He expounded unto them in all the scriptures, including the writings, the things concerning himself. The veil, he's, he's taking the veil away. The veil was there. They couldn't understand. He's taking the veil away. He's not taking the scriptures away. He's taking the veil away so that the scriptures are now accessible and understandable. Verse 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spoke unto you when I was with you, that all things must be fulfilled. Notice that. He doesn't say that all things may be fulfilled. They must be fulfilled. Why must they be fulfilled? Because God is not a liar. God is faithful. We can deny him, but he will not deny himself. So all these things must be fulfilled, which were written in the Torah, in the Nevi'im, and in the Ketuvim. It's right there. It's not. So Christ is telling them, I'm going to lift the veil off the Tanakh so that you can understand it. And now that they understand it, the Berit Hadashah, what we call the New Testament, is written by people who understand and the veil has been lifted from the Tanakh. So we cannot have this separation of the Hebrew Bible and, the New, and what we call the New Testament. It's all one. And we connect it through scuba diving. While we were in South Africa, it was unfortunate that in the breakfast area, there was a lot of pork. And clearly, they're cooking the pork on the grill, and then they're cooking the eggs on top of the, the pork. And so I had to say to one of the elders there, this is a problem. This is unclean food. And he started to say, well, remember, it's a health issue. And I had to say, it's not a health issue. It's a holiness issue. Look, and this is from Torah, Leviticus 7. Leviticus 7. And just to, to, in, in all fairness, in the actual hotel where we were staying, very few brethren were staying there. So it's not like everybody's staying there and we have some clout. We have like zero clout because we, we meet there, but nobody's actually staying. Very few are staying there. They're staying in other places. So we don't have the clout to say we must have it this way. But I think brethren, we need to be educated. I saw one brother... They came to uh, another place where we were eating, and he had ordered a burger, and they put bacon on the burger, and then basically they took the bacon off and then ate the burger. Is that okay? Is it just a health issue? Leviticus 7. Leviticus 7. This is the, the holiness code. You're going to be holy before the Lord. It's all here in Leviticus. And we take the principles from the Torah and we bring them forward. Here, dealing with the offerings, Leviticus 7 and verse 19, and the flesh, the meat, that touches any unclean thing shall not be eaten. It shall be burnt with fire, discarded. 
And as for the flesh, all that be clean shall eat thereof. So here's the principle. That when something is set aside as clean, if something unclean touches it, it defiles it. So I can't have clean beef and have something unclean on it, take off what's unclean and say it's just a health issue. And so the conversation we had, he said, you know, you're right. This is a holiness issue. God is the one that says what's clean and, un and, and unclean. And he's the one that says what's holy and unholy. Let's go back to 2 Corinthians 4. Again, the point that we're making is that the gospel is, the true gospel is hidden. It's concealed. It's not obvious. As much as Isadora has this big heart and she's going around the airport praying for people, it's just not available to the general public. It's concealed. It, it requires deep diving to connect everything and understand it. We can't be superficial. 2 Corinthians 4, continuing on from where we were in 2 Corinthians 3, where we were talking about the veil. In 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 1, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. It's a difficult road, but the mercy that the Lord has shown us invigorates us. It strengthens us. We keep going forward. And we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. So God conceals a matter. So does Satan. And there are hidden things of dishonesty in the church. So this is why we have to study. We have to be careful. We have to discern. In fact, Christ says in the end, there'll be many false teachers. So the burden is on us to discern. We've renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. Not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. So, there's a handling of the word of God, which is not deceitful, which Paul is implying there's a handling of the word of God which is deceitful. And again, we have to go deep sea diving to make sure that we can discern this. Christ, in fact, said to us, do not be deceived. So there are, he's renouncing these hidden things, not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. So we're just plain speaking, straightforward, and commending ourselves to every man's conscience. And we're doing this before God. So these things are hidden, these hidden things of dishonesty. But notice... If our gospel be hid, so the gospel is also hidden. And if it's hidden, it's hidden to them that are lost. So unfortunately, there are vessels of honor and dishonor. There are wheat and tares. And it's possible to be around the gospel and not understand it. It's possible to, to the gospel's in front of you, but it's hidden. It's in front of me, but it's hidden. And he says, if it is hidden, it's hidden to them that are lost. In, in a sense, there's no excuse. We have the tools to dig, to understand. The veil has been removed in Christ. But he says, it's hidden to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which don't believe. We stand by faith. Faith, let me just make what faith is not. Faith is not Oh, I believe I can climb mountains. I believe I can get over this mountain. That's not faith. Faith is not, oh, I love God and I believe in him. Faith is, it says right here that God has promised to do this thing. I don't know how he's going to do it, but he said he's going to do it. I trust God. This is faith. I am anchored in the promise of God. This is faith. If I'm saying, don't be anchored in the promise of God. In fact, God doesn't really know what he's doing. He makes promises and then he breaks them. This is, can never be faith. I, I will overthrow the faith of some if I make this error. To say, don't worry about the promises God has made. He's not keeping them anymore. I'm overthrowing faith. To establish faith is to say, this is what God says. It's an anchor. 
So to believe not is to say, yeah, I know God's word says this. I know the prophets say this, but I don't believe it. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on, shine on them. For we preach not ourselves. We're not promoting ourselves. But Christ Jesus the Lord. And ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. We're, we're preaching Christ. And then we're just servants. We're not trying to promote ourselves. In fact, this is a costly endeavor. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So Paul has this incredible privilege of the veil being lifted and having this light in his heart so that because he's been enlightened, he can now give the light of the knowledge, which we might not have had, we might have been ignorant, but we're growing in the grace and knowledge. So he's giving us this knowledge of what? Of the glory of God. Well, we heard earlier, it's the glory of God to conceal a thing. But kings, it's their glory. It's our glory to search it out. So here is how we can search it out. The knowledge of the glory of God, it's in the face of Jesus Christ. The gospel is one story. Jesus Christ is the Holy One of Israel. You know, let's go to Isaiah, one of the prophets. Isaiah 49. Let's see this glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That Paul, in his preaching the gospel, is giving light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The, that same face that is hidden from Israel. God says, I will hide my face from Israel. Paul says, we have the incredible privilege of revealing the glory of God's face to Israel. Isaiah 49 And verse 3, I'll just take this one verse out of this chapter. And said unto me, you are my servant, O Israel. Israel is the servant of God. Nobody else. There's no replacement. You are my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. So if we're going to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God, in the face of Jesus Christ, it has to reconcile with all the prophets. And the prophets are saying, or God is saying through the prophets, I'm going to be glorified in Israel. So what is our gospel teaching? Can we teach the gospel from this? Look at chapter 40 of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah 40 and verse 9. O Zion, you holy people, set apart, sanctified, understanding the work of the Lord. O Zion, that brings the gospel. Beautiful. How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good tidings. O Zion, that brings good tidings. Get you up into the high mountain. You've got the gospel. You've got the true gospel. Get to a place where you can broadcast it. Get you up into the high mountain. O Jerusalem, that brings the gospel. Lift up your voice with strength. This is no time to be cowardly. This is no time to back down. These people around us are insane. Are they going to frighten us? So that we're, we're afraid to preach God's word? Because they're flexing their muscles and they're insane? Lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up. Don't be afraid. Now, when we lift up this voice with strength, when we preach the gospel without fear, who's the target? Who, who are we taking this message to? O Zion, O Jerusalem, lift up your voice. Get up into the high mountain. Don't be afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah. Oh, is that in your Bible too? We've got to take this to Judah? 
I thought God replaced Judah with the church. Say unto the cities of Judah, behold your God. What is our understanding of the gospel that we could, we could preach this? And we could go anywhere. Just open the Bible at random and we'll teach this from any page in the Bible. Behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. Study to show yourself approved. A workman that need not be ashamed. I've been in the church for decades. Christ comes. He comes with his reward. But it's not just reward and then sit down. He's ready to work. And when he's ready to work, I, I'm sorry, Lord. I have no clue what you're talking about. I, I, what do you, well, I, I, I don't, I've never heard these things before, what you're saying. And he's like, oh, fools. And slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. We need to deep dive. His work is before him. He shall feed, he, this work, what is this work? He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. Who are these that are with young? Who are these lambs that he's going to gather? Let's go to Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Who are these lambs that he's going to gather with his arm when he returns? And who are these that he's going to gently lead that have young? Again, we're deep sea diving. We can go anywhere. And, and every, every, every person who's inspired is saying the same thing. It's all the same gospel. Matthew 24 and verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. It's not just, and a gospel of the kingdom. As long as I'm preaching a gospel of a kingdom, I'm on track. No, no, no. He said, this gospel, the gospel that Christ was preaching of the kingdom, the gospel that when he was resurrected, his disciples asked him, is it at this time you're going to restore the kingdom to Israel? It's this gospel. This is the gospel that's going to be preached in all the world to all Gentile nations as a witness. And then the end shall come. Verse 16. At this time, let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. It's good news because of the bad news that precedes it. Let them that be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. This, this is existential. These are the covenant people who are facing an existential crisis. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. So Christ is returning to this. And he says he's going to send his angels to the four corners of the earth to gather his lambs. And he says he's going to gently lead those that are with young after they've been through this horror. So this gospel is hidden, and we have to work for it, and Judah cannot be separated from it. Look at Jeremiah 31. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up on this point. My final point is let not many be teachers, but I think I'll push that uh, forward just for time. But let's just go through a couple of scriptures here to finish off that Judah cannot be separated from the gospel. I don't know if you've ever been to maybe dinner with somebody or at a restaurant and, and you ever meet somebody that they just talk and they never stop talking. And, and they begin, they, they themselves lose track of what they're talking about. And maybe the waiter comes and interrupts and they say, what was I talking about again? I don't know. You don't even know. Well, do we have a gospel message? where we lose track of what the subject is. What is the subject from Torah to Revelation? 
Or are we kind of preaching a gospel where we're just out on a limb somewhere and, and it has, it's not rooted in the Torah? You can't tie it back to the foundation. Or no matter what we preach or where we preach, it's always tied back to Torah. Jeremiah 31. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It's not, it's not for Gentiles. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they broke, although I was a husband unto them, says the Lord, they broke it. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts. They will be in Christ. The veil will be lifted, according to Deuteronomy 30. And I'm going to put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts, their hearts, and will be their God. And they shall be my people. Verse 36. The sun and the moon, if those ordinances depart from before me, says the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. We, we have to be careful that we are not putting people in a position where they don't believe the word of God. That they're reading these promises and they just read over them. Because we haven't set them up to see how faithful God is. Hebrews 3. Actually, sorry, for time. Let's go to Acts 13. Hebrews 3. We'll come to in a, mo in a moment. Let's go to Acts 13. Remember, Paul anchored his gospel in God raising Christ from the dead. Here again, we see in Acts 13, the same teaching. Here Luke writes in Acts 13, verse 29. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. But God raised him from the dead. This is part of the gospel story. And he was seen many days of them which came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses unto the people. And we declare unto you the gospel. We're, here, here's the gospel how that the promise which was made unto the fathers, God has fulfilled the same unto us, their children. This is the gospel. God keeps covenant. God is faithful. So we cannot declare a gospel where we're unable to go to the promises, go some, do some scuba diving, and go into the promises all the way back to the Torah and say, this is the gospel. He's fulfilled the promise which was made to the fathers. God has fulfilled those promises unto us, us, their children, in that he raised up Jesus again. So the resurrection of Christ has to do with being the seed of David and the promises that were to us, the Jews. As it is also written in the second Psalm, the Ketuvim, the writings, you are my son this day I have begotten you. Verse 38. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, through Jesus Christ is preached unto you, the Jews, the forgiveness of sins. And by him, all that believe are justified from all things, from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Beware, therefore, lest that come upon you, which is spoken in the prophets. So there's a threat associated with the gospel. I'm just going to go to Hebrews 13, uh, Hebrews 3, and then I think I will pause here, but we'll break here, and then I'll come back uh, in a couple of weeks, God willing, and uh, finish this. Hebrews 3. <laughs> Hebrews 3, and we'll break in at verse 17. But with whom was he grieved 40 years? Was it not with them that had sinned? whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? This is the issue. This is why Paul says, 
uh, Philetus and Hymenius, they're overthrowing the faith of some through their teaching. Faith is not, oh, I believe in God. Faith is, I believe in God's word. And so through their teaching, they were overthrowing the belief in God's word. And so here, these people did not believe God's word. And Paul warns us, be careful, Gentiles, that you're not getting bold in your own conceits. In fact, he says, be terrified. Because they fell because of unbelief. And if you start making up a doctrine that does not, is not rooted in the Torah, that's unbelief. So we see that they could not enter because of unbelief. Verse 1 of chapter 4, let us, the first fruits, therefore fear. Lest a promise being left us, it's not a promise being made to us, it's a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached. We definitely heard the gospel. But it's not just that we heard the gospel. That same gospel that was preached to us, it was also preached to them. The same people that God was not pleased with, that he cut them off, that they didn't believe, they had the gospel. So what, what, what was their understanding of the gospel? Clearly it was rooted in the Torah. What is our understanding of the gospel? Because it's the same gospel. But the, the only difference is, the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. So faith is believing God's word. The gospel, the true gospel, is concealed. It's the glory of God to conceal it. When he actually reveals everything, he's going to be fully glorified all over the earth. But for now, it's only accessible by the first fruits. But we have to be careful because the true gospel cannot be separated from Judah. If I'm giving a sermon here about the gospel, and throughout my entire message, not once do I mention the covenant of Judah, and I'm preaching the gospel, there's a problem. There's an issue. Because we cannot separate the gospel from Judah. We are grafted into this covenant, not to take it over. So let me pause here, and uh, God willing, not next week, because I'm doing the, the prophecy campaign next week, but maybe the following week, uh, I'll conclude this. And I want to conclude by finishing off this section that the gospel can't be separated, and then we need to be very careful as teachers. All of us need to be students. All of us need to be studying, rightly dividing. But not all of us need to be teachers. And those of us who are teachers, we need to be studying all the more so that we do not overthrow the faith of some. So again, for, for my brothers here, I thank you for how you inspire me and that Together, we're turning the people to the word of God. We're not turning them to us. We're not turning to our personal doctrines. We're turning them to the word of God. And for our brothers and, uh, who are teachers uh, out in your various congregations, all the more we have to study, to show ourselves approved, to ensure we're not overthrowing the faith of some. So God willing, I'll come back in a couple of weeks and finish this.